This is Vanessa Marshall, voice of Black Canary, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Black Canary, 1-3. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we have with us a gem of a human being, the talented and prolific Vanessa Marshall. Her acting career began in 1994 and includes live-action appearances in shows like Law & Order and Jane the Virgin, video games like Knights of the Old Republic 2, Mass Effect, and Injustice 2, and animated productions like Flashpoint Paradox, Star Wars Rebels, Justice League Crisis on Two Earths, Wolverine and the X-Men, and of course, Young Justice. Vanessa, we are honored to welcome you to the Whelmed. Thanks for coming on. Oh, I am so happy to be here. I'm so glad we finally got this together. It's great to hear your <laughs> voice and, and be here. <laughs> Thanks. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series and the first half of season three, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. We may also be talking about some projects that Vanessa has worked on in the past that she can talk about anyway without an NDA, so be uh, be aware of that as well. And with all that out of the way, let's, uh, let's dive in. So, uh, I mean, I... T- took a very light skim of your prolific career. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about like who you are, what you do out in the world? Well, yeah, definitely. Uh, I am a voiceover actress, stand-up comedian, uh, was a plus size model. <laughs> that's another, that's a whole other discussion, but, um, yeah, I make a living, uh, voicing, uh, various characters in cartoons and, I've been blessed uh, to work on Young Justice, and uh, I've played other characters like Wonder Woman and um, Poison Ivy, and then in the Marvel world, Black Widow, Mary Jane, um, all all kinds of um, really sort of amazing, iconic female roles. And then some fun ones like uh, in The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, I played a little African-American boy named Irwin. That's that's sort of the fun of voiceover is that you can transcend gender and and you know it's only, you're only as limited as your imagination. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, I went to Princeton for undergraduate um, studies. I majored in English, and I went to NYU graduate school. I got a master's in acting, where I learned all sorts of dialects that have been very helpful in the world of voiceover, and. Um, yeah, I continue uh, writing today. I'm working on a novel, and uh, I, I think I'm probably going to start doing stand-up uh, in the middle of this year. I got asked to do a show in June, so uh, I'm I am a an eternal student and uh, love taking classes and um, staying current. And uh, so it's just been a really wonderful magic carpet ride. <laughs> yeah, you have a variety of things. I didn't know you did stand-up. Oh yeah, uh-huh. is this a, is this a new thing, or is this something you've been doing for a while? No, it's something I've been doing for a while. Um, I, uh, I've always been sort of like the, the comedic sidekick in life <laughs> and, um, you know, in the on camera world. And, uh, I just, I, I think laughter is the best medicine. So I've always gone where the love is and, uh, I, I find that it's in the laughter. So I love comedy. Yeah. But the, the, I find that interesting because the roles that I best know you for Wonder Woman not known as a comedy level of <laughs> superhero. Yeah, uh, no, not really. Huh? Very serious Black Canary, uh, an amazing Black Canary in Young Justice. Uh, Hera um, yeah. in Rebels as well. I, I think I think any good drama is is relieved by comedy, and any good comedy is enhanced by some drama as well. So oh. being able to play into those roles, do you find that you have leaned into uh, comedy roles at all that I might not be aware of? Um, or is that just something that does it feel like it's something different because the roles that you play in the things that we're, uh, that I'm really the most familiar with are definitely more dramatic roles. Um, yeah, well, I've, I've done a number of comedic, uh, roles. There are a few, um, like I'm thinking in, um, I played Pepper Potts in, um, 
uh, the video game. Oh my God, Bandicoot. What is it? Uh, Ratchet and Clank. That's it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was in Pig, Goat, Banana, Cricket on um, Nickelodeon and Breadwinners. And uh, I've done a lot more comedic stuff for uh, Cartoon Network, um, stuff for Ben 10. And uh, oh, right. Uh, there, there have been a number, and Powerpuff Girls, I got to play Donnie, the butch unicorn. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, definitely, I've definitely had a few roles that were um, sort of much more uh, comedic in nature, but I suppose they're not the ones that I'm you know, necessarily well known for. But yeah, I really enjoy doing all those. <laughs> nice. So, so in, in, in building off that, what we're talking about here... Um, how did you how did you get into acting? You said you had you, your degree. You have a degree in English. Is that what you said? Yes, um, I've I've always loved telling stories, and I love writing. I love reading stories. That's why I love comic books and and films, and obviously animated shows. But um, I, I applied to graduate school for acting. A friend of mine, Matt Rausch, who uh, was in Banshee and a number of wildly successful shows, he's an amazing actor. He needed a scene partner. Um, for his NYU audition. And um, I ended up doing the scene with him and I ended up getting into graduate school and he did not, which was, you know, he was not thrilled about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, I ended up spending three years in graduate school and uh, that's when I started doing stand up comedy in New York and um, ended up moving back to Los Angeles, which is where I'm originally from, and uh, doing stand up and sketch comedy here and pursuing on camera roles. I was in scrubs and actually I did a law and order when I was still in New York. Uh, but once I started doing voiceover, I, I was exclusively booking work in that area and decided to pursue that alone. And I, I mean, because I was so busy doing it, it was easier to just make that my focus. And that's been the case since 1997. Right. Um, I did note that you, that you had a role on Jane the Virgin though, relatively recently, right? Yes, you were doing voiceover, yeah. though. That's right. Yes. I was the female narrator. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. So technically still yeah. voiceover. Yeah, exactly. I was not on camera for that. But, oh, uh, wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, so so where did the transition come from? So you, you came back to Los Angeles. You started booking some voiceover work. But like, how did that transition occur? Like somebody who's who's looking for voiceover work or, or you know has getting their degree in acting and coming back to Los Angeles, some something happened there that there's got to be a story. Well, um, I wrote a one person show uh, for myself that was uh, I created about twelve different characters. Oh, um, nice. it was it was a cyber dating game, and I played the host, the contestant, and uh, or all the contestants and. I interacted with previously recorded footage of myself. It was very meta theatrical. Uh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a meditation on technology's influence on interpersonal relations, and because uh, at that point, you know, um, the sort of online dating was was all the rage. Right. Um, but at any rate, uh, a, an agent saw me in that show and said, "You know, you really might want to try animation. Why don't you come into the voiceover agency? I'll read you." Um, I went in, I read for her, I was terrible, but she had faith in me that I would, you know, if I took a ton of classes that I might actually book. And so began mm. my journey. And uh, when I say I'm an eternal student, I, I mean it. Like I'm taking a mocap class in April. I can't wait. I want to learn more about mocap. Motion capture, you mean? Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. Mm. Uh-huh. Uh, the technology behind uh, the creation of video games. I have not worked much in that motion capture field. And uh, there's just always something to learn. So um, I started doing that back then and I continue to do that. And it's very stimulating and fulfilling. And yeah, I just, it's never ending. It, it's awesome. It's kind of like, it's kind of like golf. You just have to <laughs> keep playing and get to improve your game and, and keep expanding. Yeah. I mean, but this is, I mean, you do a wide variety of things and like most people that that you know from the people that we interact with know you from your your voiceover work but but clearly you're doing so many other things that seem to that, that I can only imagine are feeding back into the experiences of being able to do the voice work because the more experience you have the more you can draw on for your acting right absolutely absolutely yeah i actually participated um when i was in sketch comedy uh 
quite some time ago when I first moved back here. I made a group of friends uh, over at Acme Comedy Theater, and last night I did a play reading. One of the people that I did sketch with, he wrote a play, and we all sat around and read it out loud, and there was an audience, and it was lovely. And it was just a, a reminder that, ex that it's exactly what you're describing, that you know, sort of the more that we do, it sort of feeds our souls. And then we bring that back to the microphone. And, and I think there's some sort of intangible essence that is uh, palpable. There's just something about uh, having a very full life that brings a fullness to one's voice. And I, I think that informs other work. So I, I've always felt that it's important to, you know, be busy in all kinds of areas uh, to once again, be stimulated and inspired and um, you know, keep everything fun. <laughs> yeah. This, I think that, and that's applicable, not just of course for voice work, but any creative endeavor, the Absolutely, more thing, the I more agree. thing. Sure. And you said, you said you were writing as well. Yes, I am. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I, when I, I transitioned from doing stand up to doing these live storytelling events. So a lot of them were essay writing, not competitions, but, um, there would be a theme for the night and people would read essays that they had written um, based on those topics. One of them, uh, there was a, a show here in Los Angeles called True Tales of Love and Lust. There were just like stories of, of botched romances and stuff like that, all, all very funny, nothing lusty about it really. <laughs> but, um, but one of my essays that I had written, uh, the woman who put the show together, Anna David, actually published um, a bunch of them and uh, she published one of my essays in her book. And um, so I have, I have a collection of essays that I'm also considering publishing in addition to the novel that I'm on the second draft of. And uh, yeah, again, I've, it's all about finding one's voice, you know, and, and however we do that, it, it, it uh, can only help in, in every area. Like you, like you say. Yeah. Well, um, before you became a part of Young Justice, you, you had mentioned loving story. And clearly that's something that's coming across because you're actively pursuing story from multiple different angles, yeah, right? For sure. Com comedy, drama, voice acting, writing, essays. <laughs> Before you got involved with Young Justice, what, were you, what was your experience with, with comics in general? DC maybe specifically, but just comic storytelling in general. You've worked on a number of different superhero animated series. What, what's that history? Well, you know, to go back sort of the, I'm a very, very huge Star Wars fan. And one of the things that George Lucas really celebrated was this idea of myth and uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, specific ideas of the hero's journey. Right. And um, I think those concepts really drove me, not only, you know, in my own quest for faith on the planet, but um, uh, that it just, it, it presents a uh, sort of an archetypal journey that I seek out in literature. And uh, I found oftentimes in comic books, both DC and Marvel. I, I just, I love the complexity, the passion, the challenges, and uh, they're, they're sort of fables in a way that teach us how we can live our lives better or how we don't want to live, or we get to sort of witness how we may not want to live our lives and, um, and the prices yeah. that we pay and, and that others must pay based on our decisions and how important that is. So, you know, the story of star Wars provided that for me and tangentially, uh, different stories in DC as well as Marvel. Also, they captured my imagination and, um, inspired me in a similar way. I also like the lock and key comic. Yeah. I, oh, I mean, yeah. I, again, it's like, I'm a sucker for a good story in any medium. And, uh, I, I don't really, and I, strangely, I love all music as well. There's not really like one kind of music where I'm like, Oh, that's terrible. Just because there's a story in every song and you know, I'm a Libra. So maybe right. that has something to do with it. Meaning, you know, I can sort of see what's interesting in, in, pretty much anything. So, uh, there's always a lesson to be learned even in a, like, a any kind of song, really. Um, my music collection is pretty vast, <laughs> but, uh, but I like having an open mind and, and, uh, exposing myself to, to different things in, you know, music as well as literature and in comic books. So there's something really gratifying about them that made me feel less alone. <laughs> 
Is there any particular characters or arcs that that really drew you from either DC or Marvel when you were reading those stories? I really love Peter Parker and I love Mary Jane's relationship to him and how they sort of dovetail back and forth in his evolution um, and, and sort of coming of age and into his power. Um, that always fascinated me. I loved Wolverine. I love Jean Grey. Wonder Woman always inspired me, you know, from, from a very, very early age. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just would always aspire to her values. <laughs> and now you've played her on multiple occasions as well. How does that feel? Yeah. Oh, it's just an honor. It, it's, it's, uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's really, it, it's staggering. I'm I, like, I can't even believe it. I have to pinch myself. It's banana. Yeah. <laughs> I never would have thought, never would have thought. Now, now on that, on that note, uh, is he correct? So your your mother's Joan Van Ark. Yes, she is. Yeah, and she voiced Spider Woman in the nineteen seventy nine. That's true. Animated Spider Woman show. Yes, I I remember sitting down and watching that show, and uh, uh, I when I read that, I it, just, it for some reason it just blew my mind. Wow. Right from something that I have such strong memories of watching um, back in the day, being nine at the time. You were. Yeah, <laughs> you had to have been pretty young. Yeah, I don't even as well know. I'm not happened. even sure exactly. Yeah, uh, that that honestly that that is bananas too. That she was sort of working in the world of voiceover at prior. I mean, yeah. But is that did that? I, I mean, I have to look at that and like. So she she's doing the voice of Spider Man, Spider Woman back in the 70s, and you're doing like Mary Jane. Yeah. In Greg Weissman's spectacular Spider Man as well, right? Like, it, is there? It, it was this parallel evolution. Did she have an influence on kind of you heading in this direction? Do you feel, or is this just something that you got drawn to separately from that? I think it was separate because she was mostly on camera. Um, she aspires more to tell stories in that way. Um, whereas I, you know, it's funny, they say some people act to be seen and other people act to hide. And I think my mom, my mom enjoys being seen and I prefer the invisibility of voiceover. I, I I saw, you know, my mom's privacy sort of not be compromised, but, um, it's weird in, in, in our world. And by our world, I mean, sort of the Comic-Con world or the, those who value yeah. comic books and so on. We're, we're pretty decent people. Not that people in the theatrical world aren't, but I just, yeah. I feel really safe in the world of voiceover. Um, when one starts getting into the world of on camera TV and film and all that, it just seems like, uh, you know, TMZ or some, some of these things, these like they're, they can be almost like predators or something, <laughs> you know, trying right. to, to really invade the privacy of, of celebrities. And I get that celebrities sign up for that, but I'm just really grateful in the world of voiceover that we don't really face anything like that. Yeah. Uh, and I watched my mom go through stuff like that with National Enquirer or whatever it is. And yeah. um, that just didn't really appeal to me at the end of the day. I don't need to tell stories that badly. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, I'm glad that, that – um, there just feels like there's something very sacred and um, special uh, in particular with the young justice franchise. I mean, we've always had young justice meetups, uh, you know, at all kinds of uh, comic cons and, you know, there's no, we're all fans. There's, there's no issue of celebrity or, um, you know, the actors being apart from the fans. We are all fans. And the very fact that the fans came together to, you know, just rally to the cause of, of creating season three is such a testimony to the fact that, um, I mean, that's just how cool they are. And we are eternally grateful for that. And, uh, I look forward to many more meetups. It's just awesome that we've all remained in contact. And, you know, even though the show didn't continue for quite some time there, I would see people at events and be like, Hey, you know, it's sort of like we have friends for life. And, uh, I don't, I don't, know that my mom had that experience with Knott's Landing or Dallas, right. <laughs> where, you know, like, Hey, who shot right. JR? High five. You know, right. Like right. That there's, there was always the way people approached my mom was a, like, she was a, a friend because they spent every Thursday night with her, but also right. like they sort of deify people on camera. And I, I understand that, but I don't, I think voiceover people maybe were more down to earth, but we're, we're, just 
uh, accessible and and ready to talk about young justice 24 hours a day <laughs> you know yeah no we well we obviously we understand <laughs> um so speaking about that though let's bring it back to young justice a little bit so i mean we normally we ask uh, um our discussion guests when was the first time you saw young justice that doesn't really apply f- for you um so can you instead tell us a little bit about how you got the role of black canary like your thought process behind it, how it, ha- how it came about and, and what you thought about? It. Well, yeah, I had just finished doing, uh, Mary Jane, um, in spectacular Spider-Man with Greg and, uh, Greg called me in to audition for black canary and specifically. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as far as I know, yeah. And, um, and he directed me through the audition and it was such an interesting version of black canary where she was this sort of counselor Mm -hmm. um and um and i really i felt grounded in that uh, intention and and that that was sort of her goal that that guided the voice yeah and we discovered it together and we and we landed in a place that he felt really comfortable with and we sort of kept it there yeah it was really it was a lovely experience there's a this this version of Black Canary. Uh, it may not be a surprise to say is is pretty much my favorite version of Black Canary that I've seen, yeah. and part of it I think is because of this um, this balance she has of mm. she doesn't give up her compassion, yeah. And she doesn't give up her emotional connectedness, mm-hmm. particularly to the kids, but to other people as well. She doesn't have to give that up to stand next to Superman fighting a Mazo. Right. Like she doesn't have to give up. She can balance those things together. Right. Um, and uh, we had Dr. Andrea Letamendi on. Oh, I, I love if, her. She's, she's great. She's fantastic. And she actually yeah. came on the show and, and uh, we went through fail safe and disordered um, the episodes, you know, the traumatic episode. And then, of course, the episode after that, where Black Canary is sitting with all the kids. Yeah. And and. The representation, not just of Black Canary in general, but the scene, the way the scene was set up, she said, was was wonderful. There was there was no like cliched stereotype, stereotypical couch that the kids were laying on. It's you're sitting across from somebody and you're at their level, and you're talking and you're listening, and yeah. um, that really comes across in Canary, where you are able to pull off this um, strength to mm. tell Superboy to. <laughs> To get over here and and stick around classes in session and also to be compassionate and listen to the kids. There's a balance that you bring to your voice in that character. Um, do you feel like that's different than, say, for some of the times you played, say, Wonder Woman or Mary Jane? Or Yeah, I think so. It did have more of kind of a therapeutic uh, vibe to it. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on myself and... Um, you know, having grown up the daughter of a celebrity, there there were that presented certain challenges in life, and uh, for whatever reason, that's really why I love Luke Skywalker's journey. <laughs> Believe it or not, no, that, dive, uh, unpack that. Well, for for me, the dark side was the entertainment industry, and <laughs> I feel like it. I feel like it took my mom away from me. You know, yeah. And uh, you know, the do you want to be happy or do you want to be right uh, is a really noble question, and uh, yeah. You know, at at a certain point, I've become my mom's best friend, and and there's been a lot of healing there. But it, it took a lot of trigonometry to sort of get to that place. And given that work that I've done on myself, I think that that helped lend itself to Black Canary's ability to sort of be there for them emotionally, to help foster their growth and and heal any of their resentments and their challenges and any of that post traumatic stress that they experienced. And I feel very comfortable dialoguing in that world, um, you know, for myself. So it was interesting to put a, a superhero in that, in that place. So were you, were you surprised in any way about this, about kind of where young justice was sitting, like the, the, the storytelling that was going on at the time, like while it was happening? Yeah, I would never have guessed. And, uh, season three is just epic. (laughs) I I remember going to have lunch with, uh, Greg and I would meet him at his office and, you know, he would sort of quickly shoo me out of there because I, of course, wasn't supposed to see any of the 10 million <laughs> cards. cards that he had on the wall. I mean, I looked at the sea of note cards and I just thought, my goodness, it was either <laughs> supreme madness or just genius. 
correct. Uh, and of course, it was the latter. Right. And uh, you're waiting I for just, the conspiracy board with the red yarn going. Oh all yeah. Night. I yeah. mean, it was it was <laughs> epic, and I, I and I think they have truly done an amazing job. I mean, the fans wanted it, and the, and he was going to give the fans, you know, more than than they could ever have imagined. And I I can't wait for uh, the remainder of the episodes to air. And uh, I'm just so happy for their success. I think it's just doing great. And I, I hope there'll be more, you know, we, who knows? We'll all find out together. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. So far we're, we're all just waiting to hear. Yeah. So the scene of the, the main scene, of course, that I think of when I think of black Canary is just is in episode one, right. When, when green arrow and Batman are, are leaving and Canary yeah. Canary is so angry with Ollie. Like you knew this. You know, yeah, uh, she, she got, yeah, <laughs> that, um, were you now in, in we, some of the voice actors we've talked to in the past, there's a lot of times where you guys get to record together, which is not always the case for things like video games and that kind of stuff. Were, were you, were you, uh, during that recording, were you in the room with Alan Tudyk and Bruce Greenwood no, or anybody else? I wasn't. Okay. I, I actually know Alan, uh, from all the star Wars stuff that we've done. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I know we were not in the same room together and it, and it's funny because we weren't in the same room in the earlier episodes either. Oh, really? So, yeah. And when I met him, um, I was at star Wars celebration. Gosh, when was it? 2017, I guess in Orlando. Um, I said, no, I was like, Hey, by the way, I'm black canary. And he said, what? <laughs> and, and cause I, I know him through other friends as well. And so we've, um, we've, always sort of said, Hey, how you doing? Then the star Wars thing happened. I was like, Hey buddy, I think we have that in common. Yeah, that's cool. And, and by the way, I'm black canary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and like, by the way, we're great. dating slash married on a show. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Uh, you know, great working with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, okay. So the, the, the there's a testimony to the acting skills that you both have because the scenes that you guys are in together or that Ollie and, and Dinah are in together, they have, they, there's a lot of chemistry there. And I think it's, I think it's very evident it, in that. It's hilarious. <laughs> in that, in, I mean, in that. I have no idea what he did on his end and then, or what they had to choose from or, you know what I mean? It's right. just amazing. I think it's testimony to their editing abilities. I think yes. it, it lets you know that they're 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 really talented as editors. <laughs> yeah, because it just feels like she is she is about ready to punch him in the face, and the way that she jumps, she figures out what happened ahead of time. Like yeah. anyway, I could talk about that one scene forever because it's like basically the bomb drop right at the beginning of of the, the the season, and then it just kept going from there for season three. So um, yep. yeah, yep. In, yep. incredible. So what was it? What was it like? Coming back, I mean, after so many years being off and coming back and stepping back into the role, seeing the same, you know, the people again, was it easy to slip back into her? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was great to see everybody, uh, you know, who happened to be there the day that I was there. And, you know, it was, it was like falling off a log. We, we were all so giddy, like a bunch of kids, you know, like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> it was, it was uh, just I don't know, man. It was like seeing your family, you know, like you'd yeah. been away for a few Christmases and you come back and it's like you'd never left. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. I mean, I can definitely see some parallels between Hera and Black Canary. This uh, kind of balancing of, of nurturing and, and uh, warrior, you know, different yes. kind, different yeah. kinds of warrior. Right. But also someone who's insightful, um, who brings people together. Um, yeah. And do you, do you see like the creative process that happened behind something like Rebels and Young Justice? I, I love them both. They're both pretty brilliant storytelling. Do you see parallels between those or do you see how those might be a different than maybe some other animated series that you've done? I mean, some of the stuff you're talking about are things like episodic, younger audience related shows. But in, in relation to something that might have a, a longer, stronger or like a longer meta plot, like those are two heavy, heavy meta plot series. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that that they uh, these characters do have um, similar nurturing abilities. Uh, perhaps Black Canary is more clinical in a sense. Yes, and, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and and her abilities are more sort of supernatural and fierce at the end of the day, whereas Hera 
is much more practical and um, also very nurturing and kind, but there's something, you know, she's a pilot and she, she has that sort of very strong ethical system that, that, uh, that goes with, with flight and perspective and Mm. she's supremely talented in that area. But, uh, she has more moxie in a weird way. She's a little more, she's a little more gruff. Um, and, uh, she definitely, uh, is hardcore, but she does have a sense of humor about things. And, um, I was just thinking as you were talking about when you said Black Canary is more a little more clinical, and yeah. I was thinking, and you know what, Hera, Hera does she's she's incredibly intelligent, brilliant tactician and pilot, but she yeah. definitely uh, seems to speak more like the psychology of Hera seems like coming more from the heart, like or more feeling, uh, not like yeah. Um, I don't know, not like shiny, hippie, lovey feeling, but like, you know, she, she's following her feelings, her intuition. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, a little differently. And then her, did you work in the same room as well with the the actors? Or did you? Yeah, with did the you main work? cast. Strangely, I never worked with Thrawn, who, I mean, if Hera's from her heart, Thrawn, the villain, is yeah. definitely from his mind. That guy, talk about a chess player, geez Louise. Yeah. Um, but um, never acted with him, couldn't believe how well that fell together. Yeah. Um, you I didn't have, because Hera has, has quite a few scenes and they are direct. I know. They're very well, head to head. Oof. They were scarier than I could have ever imagined. Wow. And, um, and I never worked with Lando Calrissian. Uh, Billy was doing um, Dancing with the Stars at the time. So, I came in, uh, I think it was season two and I sort of laid the lines down and I, I thought, well, gosh, I mean, if it's classic Lando, I guess he'll probably do something like this. And I took my best guess and you know, that, that edited together really well. There were a lot of times when, um, I was not acting opposite (laughs) a number of people, but, but with the main cast, we were together, Freddie, Tia, uh, Taylor, Steve Bloom, you know, we were, we were definitely all together, Mary Elizabeth and, um, man, we had so much fun. <laughs> we really, we, we had a great time. Uh, it was, that was a, a great group of people. Yeah. So that, that's something, this is something I haven't actually, now I think about what we haven't asked in the other voice actors when you are, I think mostly because like Stephanie and, and Jason, they were telling a lot of stories about recording together in the same room and Black Canary though, she, she I think she has a powerful and, you know, prominent position in the first two seasons she's not in that many episodes right mm-hmm. but yeah i didn't get a chance to ask them like is are there times when you um do lines and you see the scene that came up at the end and think oh man i could if i if i if i had been across from someone or i had heard this response maybe i might have changed something a little differently or improved it um or do you think that really like falls into the hand of the voice director like jamie thomason knowing having a vision i think that jamie knows what he wants and i think he also covers the line a million different ways so that if if i'm doing a scene and that's probably why it ed- they are able to edit it together so well is they have every possible version of my response known to mankind okay <laughs> and, and we i mean again we play and do every, we we do a billion takes just so they have it Right. They have a they have a lot to choose from, so they can shuffle that deck together any way they choose, and and it really is obviously it works, and takes a lot of work. On yeah, your so part and their I, part. Luckily, I have not seen a scene and thought, "Gosh, I wish I'd heard that." Uh, most times, I see the scene and go, "Wow, how did they know that that was going <laughs> to fall together so well? That's crazy." Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, are there any any uh, I have to ask this, any, any unique or interesting recording moments that happened during either Rebels or Young Justice that you can tell us about? Um, fun moments or? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Odd moments? Uh, well, I remember when uh, Jason Isaacs came in, he opened a closet. In between takes, he did a number of things, but he opened a closet in the recording studio. Okay. He, found, he discovered a miniature golf set. Okay. Put it together, yeah, laid the whole thing out around the studio. And we're all watching him going, 
wow, this guy's never been here before. And we've never looked in that closet. And we, <laughs> we didn't know there was a miniature golf set in there. And then in between lines, he was putting and, and doing holes in one and then delivering each line perfectly, which was so perfect for his character. <laughs> and then he left. And we all were like, what just happened? <laughs> That, that was bananas. That guy just crushed it and he had a played around. golf game. Yeah, he had a perfect golf game. That was, that was insane. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, and uh, I'm trying to think uh, with Young Justice. Well, any, any time Nolan North was involved, there was tons of laughter. I know that. Uh, and, oh, when, okay. we did, when we did the song for Megan, it's Megan. We oh, right. Kind of thing. That was hilarious. Oh my goodness. I mean, the music was just fantastic. I'm not, I can sing, but it's not like, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, beg for the microphone so I can please just sing something for you. Right, so, right. So, you know, uh, luckily Kevin Michael Richardson was there and he's amazing. Um, he's but so that great. was also a unique experience trying to, you know, lay that song down in the recording. That was something I'm, we've never done before, but anyway. Uh, I'm shaking my head at this. <laughs> at this golf story. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty epic. I know Freddie, Freddie was not impressed with that. Freddie was kind of like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, oh, it's Jason Isaacs. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was pretty interesting. Um, so um, as a, as a writer and a creator myself, I got to ask you about this novel. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, tell us about it? Is this something you're working on as a side project? Is this something you're working on spec with or? Uh, no, it's, it's a labor of love. Um, and it's, uh, it's called fictionalized memoir is the genre. And it's based mm -hmm. on my experience as a, a plus size model and um, losing 70 pounds by loving and accepting myself uh, and ironically losing a very lucrative career <laughs> in the field of plus size modeling. But, uh, yeah, it's really a meditation on feminine beauty and standards and the idea of, of um, sort of trying to get somewhere. Like once we're there, we're going to be fine. And when really where we are right now is, is absolutely perfect. And that's really the, the message of the book. You know, I see so many women killing the wrong person, you know. Mm. <laughs> I mean, not literally, but no, um, I understand what but, you're saying, but just beating themselves up for not being perfect. And they're, I think they're taking, they're taking something out on the wrong person. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. Um, and, um, and so it's a comedy. It's not meant to be, you know, dark. It's darkly funny if anything, but um, right. anyway, it's something that, that really matters to me. And I really love um, helping to promote self-esteem and young women and encouraging them to, you know, live their best life now, not when they're their goal weight, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, with that in mind, it's a labor of love and it's just something that, you know, whether uh, I, I don't have any, anything other than trying to be helpful. That's sort of my goal. Okay. Um, and yeah, I did a one woman show uh, that was a 45 minute set of my stand up comedy. It was called plus me tales of a plus size model that was the second one woman show that I did. And, um, so the novel is loosely based on that material. And, uh, yeah, it's just something that when I get free time, I go back to it and I've been working on it for a while and I'm in the second draft and I, I just love it. So th this, this whole, <laughs> this whole story around this novel is, is fascinating me. I didn't know that you were a plus size model, uh, nor had a lucrative career as a plus size model. And then, transitioned to doing voice work. But the thing that really struck me is when you said, when you said that you, you lost weight, you lost weight, not because, oh, I, I want to get into acting and, and that's something that I need to do to be accepted in Hollywood or, or something to that effect. You had said, um, I ended up losing weight simply by, di by diving into or experiencing that self-actualization of self-love. Can you, can you unpack that process that was yours? Absolutely. Well, it, it turned my world upside down to be discovered as a plus size model because first of all, they said the more you eat, the more you'll work. And all my life I had heard the less you eat, the more likely you will book a job on camera. 
Right. Uh, in fact, if you could starve to death, that would be ideal, <laughs> you know? And right. um, so I was in a, a buffet line, believe it or not, um, at a party for my on-camera agent and a guy came up to me and he said, uh, you know, you really should model. And I thought he was insulting me because I was eating the entire buffet. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, and it turns out he was um, Ford modeling agents, uh, plus size modeling division uh, president. And, um, you know, he spots talent and so on and so forth. And I went in and I met with him and I met all these wonderful women who were totally empowered, who accepted themselves exactly as they are and, and were, they were truly beautiful from the inside out. And it turned my world upside down. And so I suddenly decided, well, all right, I'm going to love and accept myself the way these women seem to, and I'll see what happens. And ironically, what happened was I said I could eat as much as I wanted. And so I didn't eat as much. I I didn't mean to, I just was, I I can't explain it, but coming from a, a place of deprivation, um, and sort of limiting food and being strict with myself, I was always wanting more. But the minute I gave myself permission to eat as much as I want, I guess I didn't eat as much. Because you, because you know you could if you wanted to, therefore there wasn't a pressure to do it. Yeah, there were, there was no um, there was no reason to pack it all in, <laughs> you know. Uh, but at any rate, I, I think the overall trajectory was that this concept of self love really allowed me to let my body be where it wanted to be. And over time, over a long time, I I began to lean out very slowly. And, you know, I I came to this realization that at the end of the day, and this sentence is really the most profound one for me, the lesson was that my soul is weightless. And given that my soul is weightless, and that's the most important thing, it doesn't matter what I weigh. And then the weight fell off. And my, my, uh, modeling agent was furious because he was like, what are you going to the gym? You know, are, you, are you starving? What are you doing? Like, what happened? Where'd you go? What, what? And I, I actually, um, bought, wow. a, I bought a fat suit that I would wear to jobs and say, oh no, no, i believe me. I'm so fat. Look, whoa, whoa, you know, I would, I would try and look as fat as possible. And that's sort of where my standup came in is that I would come on stage as a size 10 I would introduce my sack of fat. I would put the fat pads on and pad up to like a size 16 while I was on stage. I would eat a candy bar while I was on stage for my career and um, just sort of talk about these stories of, you know, wishing I were fat so that I could, you know, maintain my modeling career, which is, I was probably the only woman in Los Angeles who wanted to gain (laughs) weight. But but anyway, I just find all of it so interesting, uh, especially after having watched my mom, who was a marathon runner, size zero, um, and you know wildly successful in the world of um, on camera, and you know very much rewarded for her behavior around having a perfect body and and so on and so forth. And mm-hmm. I'm so grateful to see that the media today is more likely to embrace women of all sizes, of all colors. And, uh, you know, it really wasn't like that back when I was trying to have a career, you know, in the world of on camera, uh, not in the least, I was always the fat, funny friend. And that's yeah. probably where the standup comes from. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, like I, I can't recommend self-acceptance enough. Um, not because it's better to be fat or thin, but because it's better to have balance in one's life. And, you know, to live in a more soulful manner, I think, makes life more meaningful. And the scale can just be thrown out the window. Uh, I hugely appreciate that. The idea or concept <clears throat> of that kind of self-realization or self-actualization of self-love, it's not, it's not easy. It is not a path that is easy for, for mm-hmm. people. And no. is there, I, I'm, I'm going to dig a little, I feel like there's more to the story than just like, oh, these, these women are accepting themselves. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Or that amazing realization of like, my soul is weightless is such a great statement to make, but I can't imagine you just woke up one day and that was, that was there. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but is, was there, no, I, don't, I don't think it happened abruptly. I think it happened, like I said, very, very slowly over time mm-hmm. and my worldview shifted. 
to focus more on my inner landscape and care less about my looks. And then my looks took care of themselves, which is ironic because it's so paradoxical that in surrendering something, you find the solution rather yes. than, you know, forcing it. Um, and I think sometimes dieting can, can be like that, you know, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and, you know, not that exercise, you know, sure. It's, I, I exercise all the time. I was even exercising back then at 205 pounds. Um, you know, now I'm 135 and uh, I still exercise a bunch. I love the gym. If I could live there, I would. I, I, I'm like an athlete today. I just have completely changed. Yeah. Um, I view food as fuel and, um, and I'm grateful for it. And I love feeding my body so I can go out and do things in the world. And um, it's, it's no longer some sort of spiritual means to fill an, uh, uh, an endless void. <laughs> um, you know, now I feel like I'm filled overflowing with things that I'm just not hungry in that way. I'm hungry for other things and kind, kind of trying to see how I can help other people. And uh, in a weird way, if we bring it back to Black Canary, that's really at the core of her personality. Yeah. Um, albeit clinical, um, you know, the way she's structured is that she very much cares about these kids and wants to help facilitate um, their growth. And I can identify with that. So in a weird way, uh, maybe perhaps this part of my journey also helped me find Black Canary's voice and, and her commitment to that intention. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. And this this concept, this idea that you're talking about, about I think that's the scariest part of a lot of aspects of self-realization or self-actualization, whatever uh -huh. you want to call it, or being okay with yourself, loving yourself, is yeah. this idea of letting up, letting go of the control. Because the control is, is often there because of a need for self-protection, feeling like if right. I control things, then I will know I will be safer. I will be, I, I will have some, at some self-defense mechanism, whether it's uh, internalized for yourself or whether it's his response to something external, uh, you need to protect yourself. And, and that may work in the moments that it needed to work. But I think letting go of that control is the scary part. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, and it isn't sudden. It's, it's definitely over time. Mm -hmm. um, and that transformation is is really what I'm trying to capture in my book. And it sounds like it was triggered by being around um, a group of people who, mm -hmm. again, like you were saying, paradoxically, were in this like modeling arena, but who were accepted for whatever or whoever they were or however they were. I don't think they needed permission to do that. No, of course. They, they, seemed, they seemed wired that way. <laughs> and they were a perfect fit for plus size modeling. I was not wired that way. I was insulted by his offer to begin with. Right. Initially, I was like, what? A model? For what? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks yeah. a lot, dude. <laughs> you know, you think I should be a fat model. That's awesome. I... <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, yeah. whereas these other women are like, yeah, of course I'd love to model. Why wouldn't I? I'm gorgeous. That was right. not my response. I was like, no, I'm trying to not be fat, not, you know, glorify this. Right. Um, but, uh, but I was intrigued. I was intrigued and I, and I, I went for it. And being around these, these women, uh, and I'm assuming uh, men that were part of this community as well that were like, yeah, this is it. This is great. Like you, you are yeah, who you are well, and we love it. I didn't, I didn't see other male plus size models, but there were men in this world who. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, absolutely. And I, I don't know, I guess it's like you, you sort of open yourself to discover these things and yeah, I, I, I it was a whole different world whole different world. Wow. Yeah. So, so anyway, I mean, the exact question of sort of why the, the why of who I am is really what I'm trying to capture in the book and, and hope to share. So I think it's an important question and thank you for asking it. I want to read it. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I'll finish it then. <laughs> you should probably finish it for me. Thanks for yes, finishing it for I me. I will. No problem. Honestly. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 we're, we're getting a little bit toward the end of our time here. That was, uh, that was incredible. And thank you so much for sharing, sharing that story. 
I don't know what else to say, but thank you. And I hope people, okay. people thank hear, you. thank you for asking people, people hearing that I, I think may, may be appreciative of you sharing the story, I guess is all I have to say. Absolutely. And I would encourage anyone if they have any questions or anything further, they can find me on Twitter at Van Marshall. And I'm happy to, to speak more about that in greater detail. Um, but, uh, yeah, I definitely, I think we all deserve to, to love ourselves right now, <laughs> not if and when, but right now. So yeah. I, I, I dare all of us to, you know, just make that decision right now and, uh, start the day over right now. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I do want to pull it back, uh, before we, before we bow out, um, back to voice acting, but we do have one of our Patreon backers, Karen Bowen had a, had a question for you. Oh, okay. Um, and and really, she wanted to ask a question, which I think a question that I think a lot of people would want to ask, which is, if you could tell your just starting out self in voice acting, specifically, she's acting, she's asking about one piece of advice that would help them with a smoother ride of some sort, what would it be? And uh, <laughs> besides self-love, change your day right now. <laughs> or is that it? <laughs> I would, I would say pursue your joy and the rest will follow. And, and I think I've, I've always had a sense of that, but I feel that I really know and trust that more than ever today. And, um, I would, I wish I, I could say that to my, myself that was starting out because there's always so much care and concern and, you know, maybe perfectionism or, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but I, I really, it has been my experience that if I pursue my joy, the rest will follow. You know, that, that really alleviates a lot of stress because who doesn't want to feel joyous and, and joyful, you know? And if that's where the solution lies, then, well, that's good news. <laughs> right. I agree. All right. Well, with that, thanks so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Vanessa. We're honored and we really appreciate your openness and sharing your story with us. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? You mentioned you have a Twitter account. Uh, yes, my Twitter account at Van Marshall and my Instagram account, uh, sadly not by the same name, is Vanessa Marshall 1138, uh, 1138. Um, and I'm on Facebook. I have a, a fan page there. But uh, yeah, come find me and let's let's chat more. Uh, I, I love the Watchtower. I love what you're doing. Thank you for this, and uh, I'm I'm deeply grateful to have been able to spend some time with you. And happy to do it again. Hopefully, there's a fourth season, and we'll be able to hash it all out. <laughs> I would love it. That would be great. Yeah. And thanks. Awesome. And thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode on Tumblr at thyjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if all that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us, leave us a review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.